Okay. Uh, well, thank you for having me today. Um, I was really honored to actually be featured for these webinar series for a lot of reasons. And one of them is just, I love talking about palliative care, obviously. Um, but I'm actually seeing a big seismic shift, I feel like, in terms of the appetite of clinicians to really see this as an opportunity for them to incorporate in their clinical practice. And so um, I'm happy to talk to you about it. I think there, I'd love to take as many questions as you guys have, if we have time um, on this topic, because I think it's really important. I've actually structured um, some of the talk around the ASLD guidance that came out last year, just as a way of incorporating some pearls. Um, and so I hope you find that helpful for your practice, uh, both as fellows and as you incorporate it into um, your time after uh, fellowship too. Um, so I don't have any relevant disclosures. The way I'm framing this talk is first going over key concepts related to palliative care to give us sort of a shared nomenclature of these concepts, because I think certain terms kind of get thrown around um, quite a bit, and it's important for us to be precise about them. And then I'm going to go in and talk about the guidance and highlight some key recommendations, and in doing so, um, really highlight as well some of the specific gaps I feel like um, should be mentioned in this field and try to integrate, um, try to present some actual resources that you can use to uh, integrate in your practice. So I love usually beginning most talks with the patient case because I think it kind of hits home for many of us um, who are seeing these patients day to day. So this, uh, this is a typical patient I see, a veteran um, since I practice at, at the VA. So 55 year old veteran um, with decompensated cirrhosis from NASH, um, has a number of decompensations listed here, a high meld, doesn't have cancer. And so he's coming in to our clinic to discuss liver transplantation. He's very fatigued, um, comes in with his wife. You know, we go over the typical parts of cirrhosis care, which is providing high quality education, assessing his decompensations, probably providing some degree of insights in terms of his preventative care and care related to his, his complications of cirrhosis. But I feel that a lot of times we get some questions that come maybe at the final minute of the um, encounter that we can either shrug off or, or take seriously. So some of the questions I tend to get, and this might be specific to the VA, is a lot of my patients say, how long do you think I have, doc? Me and my family just want to know. Um, what's life like after getting a transplant? I get that question a lot. And for a transplant, do you think my wife will have to take off work? So I think some of these questions can feel like, you know, they're an increase of our time. Um, not really sure how these, these questions really pertain to the goal of getting a transplant. You know, we want to, you know, sort of focus on that goal first. But I do think that it's important to kind of understand the, the tone of what these questions are really asking and really think of these as important data points in our management. So for the first question, I think what is being highlighted is this actual real, real concern about what the prognosis is and uncertainty about what to expect. Um, this patient seems to be worried about his quality of life. And it's probably important to think about assessing his quality of life or what is an important quality of life for him as a data point. And it's actually worried about, you know, we talk about identifying caregivers, but we don't always think about the actual stress of what this would actually mean to a caregiver. And again, I think these are things we sort of answer the question to, you know, we might say, we might say to how long do you think I have? You, we're saying, well, if you get a transplant, you have a long life. You know, of course, that would be the response we have to many patients. But I think we just start thinking of these as data points and, and things we should manage as part of our care. And so I'll say what I've done in my practice in this situation is start consulting specialty palliative care. And I'm hoping that by the end of the talk, you start to move in that direction as well. So I think it's important as a background to just remember um, that death is a very likely outcome for our patients with liver disease. Um, sometimes we're not as familiar with the actual numbers behind this, but this is a study that actually came out a few years ago um, and, and it integrates some, up, some other pieces of data, but showing the outcomes of patients with end-stage liver disease in three years. And you can see that a minority of them actually make it to the liver transplant wait list, about 16% very few of them actually end up getting a transplant. So out of the denominator of 100 of patients getting uh, being considered for liver transplantation, only 8% of individuals receive a liver transplant 
um, which differs depending on whether they're Medicaid beneficiaries or VA beneficiaries. And the vast majority of them will die in three years. And I think it's it's just important to highlight, and you know, we many of us come at, from high academic centers that transplant a lot of people or believe that these numbers are higher, but these are the, the true numbers. And it's important to keep that in mind. And I think part of understanding that death is a likely outcome for patients is really recognizing that cirrhosis is, is really a different condition than many of the ones that we're treating as gastroenterologists. And the palliative care world actually views decompensated cirrhosis and similar conditions as one called one that is like a serious illness. So what is a serious illness? Um, it's not just one where there's a high risk of mortality, but it's also one that excessively strains caregivers and creates uh, a negative impact on quality of life. And I mentioned this mainly for two reasons. The first is that you know, what we have to start thinking, I think, in the sense of certain diagnoses and conditions that, depending on where you are in your illness trajectory, survival may not be just the only important outcome. Um, particularly towards the end of life, it might actually start being very valuable to patients to start thinking about the impact that this condition has on the quality of life. It might be important for families to start thinking about the impact that the disease has on their caregivers. And so again, there might be other outcomes that are important. Um, and then the second reason is that I think as clinicians who are in this space treating these patients, we have to think of um, how we're doing on all of these different parts of the triangle, not just one of them. And I think we generally know that we do a pretty good job of addressing things like survival. You know, even in that patient with the MELD of 36, you're going to order HCC surveillance. But we, what we might not be doing as well is thinking about the actual impact um, and way we can address caregiver burden and quality of life issues. And I think that's kind of where um, a lot of my interest in this started. So what palliative care is at, um, at its core is an ability to address patients with serious illness. And I just wanted to provide a definition for us um, from the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care uh, to get us on the same page. So what they define palliative care as is is as active holistic care for patients with um, health-related suffering due to serious illness, particularly those at the end of life. Um, and so the real goal of palliative care is to improve the quality of life for patients, families, and their caregivers. Palliative care is not hospice. Palliative care is not just the team that is there to consult on you. So it's, it's actually a way of caring for patients. And I think it's important for us to be precise about that definition. So what we may traditionally view palliative care as is, and I do think we still do this in our training and in our practices and in gastroenterology, is we view of it as something that occurs at the end of life. And that's not surprising because a lot of the palliative care movement that started in the 1960s really centered around the hospice movement, which was providing um, high quality symptom management at the end of life. But we've actually moved past that definition, recognizing that palliative care needs for patients actually start even at just at the time that they're diagnosed with a serious illness. So the really more contemporary model is viewing that palliative care needs actually happen early and should be addressed early. And so getting a palliative care orientation to a patient's care plan early is beneficial to them. So palliative, what, one question I get asked a lot is, what do palliative care teams actually do? They actually have a guidelines, just like we have guidelines in NGI and hepatology, and they're called the Nat National Consensus, Consensus Project Guidelines. So um, the dimensions of palliative care are seen on the left. It's not just end of life care, but high quality management of physical symptoms, psychological symptoms, advanced care planning, and addressing social, social cultural, spiritual, religious, and existential issues. Um, the traditional way we think of uh, palliative care is through the lens of specialists, so specialty palliative care, which consists of an interdisciplinary team um, with multiple individuals that can span from physicians to nurses, social workers, and chaplains, etc. And that this team is ideally supposed to help provide um, an extra layer of support, not just within an inpatient setting, but also within an outpatient setting and provide a, a great deal of continuity. An emerging concept in the palliative care world has been this concept of primary palliative care, which is that because there's such a dearth and a limited supply of specialists throughout the country, um, people who are managing serious illness, including ourselves as gastroenterologists and hepatologists, should be familiar with the basic principles of palliative care and be able to do this on our own. And so being able to think of both uh, concepts, both specialty and primary palliative care is important when we say they were providing palliative care to a patient.
what put palliative care in general on the map was this really seminal randomized control trial that was done uh, by Jennifer Temmel in 2010, which some of you may be familiar with. I just wanted to briefly review. So this is a RCT of 151 patients that received either treatment as usual or, or treatment as usual with a specialty palliative care consult every month. Um, and they looked at outcomes after this palliative care team got involved um, at, at three and six months. And what they found was a dramatic uh, improvement in quality of life scores, which are that FACTL, LCS, and TOI scores, which are statistically significant. They also found a lower rate of depression at 12 weeks, um, which, was, which was significant. The most important, or probably the most provocative outcome of this trial, however, was that the patients who are in the palliative care arm actually lived longer than the people who got standard care um, by over two months, um, which was a really shocking finding of the study. This wasn't meant to convey the idea necessarily that palliative care is gonna extend the life, but it really targets and dismantles this misperception that palliative care just means that you're gonna end people's lives sooner or, or introduce hospice sooner. And importantly, not only did this arm um, increase their life, but there were lower rates of aggressive care at the end of life for the patients who received palliative care. So really a win-win situation. A separate um, qualitative analysis that was done on this during the same trial, kind of a analysis within a trial, was looking at the contents of the notes for each of the visits that palliative care was involved with these patients to kind of really answer the question, like what was in this syringe, right? What was the actually, what was actually happening? And so again, many people might believe that a lot of the first or second visits with palliative care might involve like addressing code status or talking about hospice. But you can see on the left that those were the minority of conversation topics. And in fact, probably the vast majority were more related to building rapport, talking about symptoms, talking about how this person's coping with the illness, really you know, getting to know the patient, which actually continued throughout the course of, course of the study. And it, it was only until patients were getting sicker as expected that there started to be a conversation about uh, treatment decisions, decision-making and disposition, like things like on the topic of DNR and hospice. So I think this is a, an important piece of data that we shouldn't ignore. There is evidence that um, integrating specialty palliative care and, and the care of patients with decompensated cirrhosis leads to better outcomes too. So um, some of the studies I've been part of have been retrospective studies that have found that uh, specialty palliative care consult has been associated with reduced length of stay, reduced uh, procedure burden at the end of life, as well as improved costs for hospital um, hospitals and health systems. It's been associated with a lower rate of readmissions for all comers who have been admitted to the hospital. And there's some prospective studies that have actually shown um, single arm, not high, um, a high enrollment RCTs, but have shown that um, specialist palliative care integrated with liver transplant evaluations have been associated with the reduction in mental, psychological, and physical symptoms. And when integrated in the liver transplant ICU actually were associated with lower length of stays and early goals, your goals of care discussions. There's actually a multi-center cluster randomized control trial being done across the United States right now. Um, called the Pal Liver Trial, which some of you may be familiar with, that's actually looking at um, specialty palliative care versus um, palliative care trained hepatologists and looking at the impact of care. So that the results of that would probably will be available in a few years. Um, but there, but this is all just to show that there is real teeth to the idea of not just integrating specialist palliative care in the care of other serious illnesses, but also patients with cirrhosis. Um, so I'm going to start talking about some aspects of the guidance and integrating them into the talk. And one of the tables we have is just really laying out the differences between a lot of these concepts, which again, kind of get pulled into the same uh, same word. So primary versus specialty palliative care, which we talked about. Hospice, which is a medical benefit provided to patients with less than a six-month prognosis that is usually paid through, through Medicare Part A or in the VA, um, paid through by the VA, which is a, which is centered on uh, addressing palliative care needs at the end of life, and then advanced care planning, which is this process of understanding patients' goals, values, and priorities longitudinally over the course of many um, visits um, so that the ultimate goal will be providing goal-consistent care. Um, and these activities, advanced care planning, just like a, any procedure, is actually reimbursed 
and you can have billing codes associated with it, which we can talk about. Um, and that's part of, these are all kind of key concepts of trying to integrate a lot of these things in practice. So I hope I was able to kind of share with you some details about the evidence for palliative care. I'm gonna transition and talk about, uh, go into a little bit more detail about specific gaps and palliative care for patients with decompensated cirrhosis and, and some of these resources for integration. So, um, you know, I was really lucky, you know, it's very early in my career to serve on this guidance team. We were able to get um, a big group of hepatologists, um, nurses, and uh, researchers together to, to create uh, this document. And it was a guide, what's called a guidance and not a guideline. So guidelines are usually created from a formal process with a systematic review, grade recommendations uh, through meta-analyses and formal ratings. A guidance is usually um, from an expert panel. And what we did as part of this specific review is that we actually took those national consensus project guidelines for palliative care, which we talked about and, and created different domains of palliative care. And then we did do structured uh, literature reviews that ultimately um, had a lot of back and forths for almost a year uh, that we used to develop our guidance statements. And then we actually uh, did further more um, meetings to uh, discuss key figures and tables. So um, for those of you that will likely be, you know, developing your own guidelines in the future, if you pursue a career in academics, um, these, these can be very long iterative processes, but very rewarding. Um, I'm not gonna be talking about the whole guidance because it is 25 pages long with 66 statements, but I'm gonna try to at least um, give you some insights into some of the ones that relate to advanced care planning, communication, and symptom management. So um, talking about some of the gaps in palliative care that we know about, I think it's important to just to mention um, some of the studies really that have been fundamental in highlighting this. So this is a uh, longitudinal cohort uh, perspective study um, from Lizzie Hansen, who's a researcher, nurse researcher at Portland, um, really describing quality of life issues in patients and caregivers, um, patients with decompensated cirrhosis and caregivers. And you can see, so a and quality of life, um, this was done with an instrument called the SF36, and 50 is usually a median quality of life. So you could see for pac both patients and caregivers, they had a reduced both physical and, and mental quality of life. Uh, for patients, really, the physical quality of life is in the toilet. It's 33 when a median is 50. Um, some, concept, some factors associated with a better or worse quality of life um, and both patients and caregivers were hepatic encephalopathy, you can see was associated with worse physical quality of life. Interestingly, the one factor associated with the poor quality of life in both patients and caregivers, physical and mental was refractory ascites. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it's important for us to think of when, you know, we're seeing these patients in the hospital, when they're coming to our outpatient clinics to get paracentesis, these are, this is really the number one issue affecting all of their lives. Um, and so making decisions around that's a really important and, and, you know, whether that's transplant, whether that's doing serial paracentesis, whether that's doing a TIPS. Um, so I think it's important to highlight that. Interestingly, the relationship quality um, that was espoused between patients and caregivers was very protective for, for patients and caregivers' mental quality of life. So I think it's important for us to kind of understand that, you know, certain interventions that we might think that might sound fuzzy, uh, like things like mindfulness-based stress reduction or really improving the quality of the relationship between caregivers and patients might actually have a huge impact on their care um, and are worth studying. So here are some of the um, ASLD guidance statements that are related to just general practice and the role of caregivers. So importantly, we said that palliative care can be provided to patients with uh, decompensated cirrhosis at any stage of their illness. It can be provided by any member of a care team, which includes primary palliative care like us or specialty palliative care. It does not preclude the delivery of disease-directed or curative treatment. So just because you're on the transplant list doesn't mean that you can't get palliative care. Um, and hospice is not the same as palliative care. Um, we also said that caring for caregivers is a central component of palliative care and that it's supposed to, it should be also provided across the illness trajectory. And, you know, I think another point I'll just emphasize is in making these, um, these guidances, you, you might think that we're just kind of 
piling a lot of things for the hepatologist to deal with or the gastroenterologist to deal with in their visits. And I think the opposite is true. I think what we're saying is that this should be the standard of care for these patients. And whether it's the hepatologist or just us letting more groups of individuals in to care for our patients, like social workers, psychologists, um, other members of the interdisciplinary team and help address these issues. I think that's kind of what we're going for. So I don't want uh, people on the call to feel like just because we made these guidances, we, we think they should be doing this for all each of the patients is really looking at it from a team perspective and what we should um, believe should be minimum care, standard care that should be provided to our patients that's high quality. Um, I wanted to kind of continue talking about some of the gaps uh, in palliative care um, and one of them is just the fact that, as you, many of you may know, is that they're one of the specific serious illnesses or serious illness populations that have significant and high information needs. So this was a systematic review that was uh, integrating qualitative and quantitative information, including surveys and interviews. And what they found from this study, uh, which was published in Journal of Hepatology a few years ago, was that cirrhosis, pa patients with cirrhosis have very limited understanding about what's going on. They need better and higher quality information about liver disease in general and um, what the specific treatment options are. And they really specifically need a lot more support and um, access to mental health care. And I think for many of us that see specifically diverse populations with cirrhosis, we know this is absolutely true. Um, I can tell you that in my care of patients, um, VA vet veterans with liver disease, you know, when we some see some patients in the hospital for the first time, um, I'm shocked at like how little they know of what's going on. And, you know, sometimes if it's a MEL35 patient we're seeing for the first time, we can go ahead and start talking about transplant evaluation. They might not even know the basics of their liver disease. And so I think it kind of helps us take a few steps back and recognize that these information gaps for our patients are probably a lot wider than um, other illnesses. Um, I would say even compared to patients with advanced cancer who a lot of times know what's going on, our patients are in a very different boat. Um, I, I did wanna highlight some specific issues that happen at the end of life. Um, just kind of, uh, even though that isn't what just palliative care is, it's, it's important to highlight. So two thirds of patients with uh, decompensated cirrhosis die in an inpatient facility or nursing home. Um, over half receive some form of a life-sustained treatment, whether that's dialysis or mechanical in intervention. Only 6% receive hospice. So if you actually compare this to patients who have advanced cancer, over 50% of patients with advanced cancer receive hospice, and only 6% of those with cirrhosis do. Um, one in three patients experience pain. Um, caregivers are notably incredibly unprepared for um, end-of-life decision-making, and, and caregivers also experience significant burden in isolation. And so I think it's important to recognize that, you know, when this high melder patient coming into the hospital sees us, um, if they don't end up being a transplant candidate or getting transplanted, they're really looking at, in many ways, um, a very poor end-of-life quality, and, and that's something that we can help them with. Um, this was a study I, I did for JAMA Internal Medicine that got published um, two years ago. And what this was, was I, I actually performed um, 88 interviews with, uh, with caregivers, patients, and clinicians, including social workers, physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses, um, and surgeons at three transplant centers in LA. And I was trying to understand in this, um, in this study, what, uh, why, what, what was happening with regards to advanced care planning um, for patients with decompensated cirrhosis? And so these were the main themes that we got from the study. Um, you know, surprisingly, patients were actually wanting to have these conversations about what their goals, values, and preferences were. But often during outpatient visits, uh, no one would talk to them about it. So they would just talk to their family members about what's important to them. When they did talk to their, uh, their, transplant team about uh, about end of life issues, a lot of times transplant teams tried to bat off end of life issues and really start try to have an optimistic attitude like you're going to get on the list or you're going to do well and not and kind of minimize conversations about end of life care. Um, when they did discuss death, it was a way of uh, invoking behavior change. So uh, clinicians would say something like, you know, you're going to die if you don't stop drinking, you're going to die if you don't get a transplant but not use that as an opportunity to actually talk about with patients what they would feel like if they were to die. 
or to actually use this as a way of opening up a conversation about end of life preferences. Um, you, many of you may be familiar with this, which is we're, something we're trying to actively change, but uh, misperceptions that you need to be DNR while on the transplant list or that you can't have those conversations while on the transplant list is still some, a huge misperception and problem um, that we have to deal with. But even for patients who are not transplant candidates, we tend to avoid having those discussions in the effort of thinking that they might be transplant candidates at some point. So I think that that was an important thing that came out. And lastly, when we interviewed patients and caregivers, they felt completely unprepared for making decisions at the end of life. And so I think this was a, a really important um, paper for me because it kind of really highlighted that from beginning to end, patients were really getting left out of the dark from these conversations. You know, I, I sometimes get um, questions from individuals about, you know, so what is the evidence for advanced care planning? Um, and, you know, why should we, why should this matter? And it's funny because there couldn't be more high quality evidence for the importance of advanced care planning. There's 65 high quality randomized control trials across 12 countries that have really talked about, you know, what are the impact of these facilitated discussions um, or ACP videos or educational programs and skills trainings that are implemented. And, you know, importantly, they've had positive outcomes in most of these trials. I think the important part is that, you know, high quality communication about goals, values, and priorities, and being able to, um, you know, match those priorities with care plans has been shown to improve satisfaction with care and improve the consistency between what patients want and what care they got. Um, and so I think this is very definitive proof that this is important. Um, and across multiple different illness populations, including advanced cancer, heart failure, and kidney disease. Um, and it probably is more impactful, if not have more evidence than most things we do in GI. So I think that, um, I think in, when we think of advanced care planning for our patients with decompensated cirrhosis, we should really be thinking of it from the lens of something that actually has a lot of value for our patients. Um, so to that end, we did include in uh, the guidance the fact that advanced care planning should really start at the time of diagnosis of cirrhosis, um, preferably before patients lose decision-making capacity because they wouldn't be able to identify their surrogate decision-maker potentially at that point. Um, we advocated for using structured communication frameworks for um, developing care plans that are aligned with patient values. Um, this, this might sound obvious to many of us, but just making sure that when you have these conversations, like saying someone's not a candidate for transplant or delivering serious news, uh, making sure that they understand that conversation and potentially using a medical uh, professional interpreter if possible, if there are communication barriers. Um, and so I wanted to provide some, uh, some resources for those of you that may not be familiar with some of these uh, communication frameworks. So these are the ones we actually included in the guidance um, and some that I've, I've taken myself just from serious illness communication uh, trainings that I've had as part of my clinical training. So um, things like Ask, Tell, Ask, uh, Remap, which is used for uh, delivering uh, for complex goals of care discussions. One that I really love, which is called best case, worst case, which is how to deliver serious news, how to, when there's prognostic uncertainty. So a good, um, you know, a good uh, example of that is like telling someone that they're not a transplant candidate and how to do that in a very structured way. Um, I've taken all of these communication skills training courses. They're really amazing. I understand that many people won't have the time or interest in doing them, but they've really kind of changed the way I approach a lot of patient care. And there's actually good evidence that they've improved a lot of important outcomes related to communication. If you don't have the time to necessarily do all these trainings, I do actually encourage you to reference uh, or potentially read some of these uh, publications that came out in the past year. So I uh, wrote a publication on how to deliver serious news to patients with um, liver disease that's framed around telling patients that they're not a transplant candidate. It was an incredible, incredible piece written by my colleague, Dr. Ufre from GH, about how to deliver, how to, how to frame prognosis for patients when there's uncertainty. And there's another great piece written by my colleague, Dr. Woodrill at uh, Mount Sinai that's on best tips for end of life communication. So if, if you're, there's something that you guys want to use and practice, or if you want to chat about um, with regards to improving your communication skills with these patients, not only at the end of life, but earlier in disease trajectory, feel free to reference um, these publications that were recent. 
Um, I did want to just switch um, and talk a little bit about other elements of palliative care, which are um, symptom management, really, because we actually, one really important part of our guidance is that we wanted to provide clinicians a really important um, framework and uh, resource for being able to manage symptoms. You can see here in the systematic review that symptom burden for end-stage liver disease, even ones completely unrelated to complications of cirrhosis and decompensation, are incredibly high. Um, and you can see they're actually comparable to patients with cancer, COPD, CHF, and end-stage renal disease. Um, there was a recent study in clinical gastroenterology and hepatology showing that the rate of depression is one in six for patients with cirrhosis and one in two um, for moderate to severe anxiety and cirrhosis. So mental health burden is also really high. Um, so for symptoms, we kind of cast a wide net and just, first of all, uh, wanted people to be aware that, you know, we understand that there are barriers to actually assessing a full breadth and doing a comprehensive system symptom uh, assessment in our hepatology practices, but it is worth someone doing that at some point during the care of patients. Um, we stress that often the first, uh, first way of managing them should be non-pharmacologic approaches, if possible. Um, you know, addressing the underlying cause of symptoms, such as like even paritis, if someone is having, you know, um, biliary issues and acolostatic issues that are independent of their cirrhosis, those should be managed. Um, understanding that there are certain trade-offs in managing symptoms. And sometimes, for instance, if you have a decompensated patient with pain, um, that might worsen their encephalopathy. So under really eliciting goals and preferences and defining priorities and trade-offs are really important as part of symptom management. And then Ideally, symptoms should be managed in an interdisciplinary way, even though that's not always possible. It's, um, it's aspirational. So I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, but I just want you to appreciate at least the fact that we did actually spend a lot of time organizing all of these symptoms um, and, and uh, presenting it in a way that we hope was, was helpful to the clinicians who are treating them in the practice. The way in their practices, the way that we organized them um, was by obviously domain of symptoms. So this one uh, addresses pain. We um, organized them into non-pharmacologic options, pharmacologic options, and systemic therapy. So a lot of times we forget that there are non-pharmacologic options for pain management instead of just telling patients that you should, shouldn't take more than three grams of Tylenol, you shouldn't take NSAIDs, like, which is probably what we say 90% of the time. Um, there are non-pharmacologic options. There are topical options um, we can provide patients to, depending on um, the type of pain it is, um, which could be uh, you know, not just neuropathic pain, but also somatic pain. Um, and then system, systemic therapies. We actually do state also specific opioids that are safer in cirrhosis that are not associated uh, with uh, reduced hepatic function and, and will likely be accumulate. So we do mention fentanyl, hydromorphone, and oxycodone um, where appropriate are, are the actual opioids that should be considered in patients with cirrhosis that have better um, metabolism parameters. Um, although understanding that there are limitations to all of these things in a higher risk of encephalopathy, but could be a really great uh, management piece for patients whose goals are, are more aligned with symptom related care and symptom management. Um, we do the same thing for dyspnea, muscle cramps, paritis, nausea and vomiting. We give, tried to give as much detail as we could about the dosages for, uh, for each of these medications. What we didn't add is the, the pickle juice randomized control trial that came out with Elliot Tapper last year for muscle cramps. So you should add that uh, to your armamentarium too. Um, but in addition, um, as you know, you know, this could be a big issue for us in the inpatient wards. A lot of times uh, medicine teams are not always comfortable with knowing what medications are safe for patients with cirrhosis with specific symptoms, or they just might guess and just order something. So this is a way that you, know, you can either educate or push back or say that these are probably preferred medications that a patient should have while they're in the hospital, or if their primary care doctor is interested in managing their symptoms, you can use this as a way of communicating to them and ref referring them to um, probably the safest medications they can use for a lot of these symptoms. And I didn't go into them, but we do also talk about um, erectile dysfunction, depression, and anxiety, and highlight medications and non-pharmacologic options for all of those as well. Um, this was another one. Oh, we also have a nice um, summary of side effects and cautions for commonly used medications um, to also 
make sure you uh, use when you present to patients. Um, just kind of rounding out some of these symptoms. For abdominal distension, we didn't rehash you know, ascites because there's a whole guideline on that, but there is some emerging data that uh, abdominal drains can be used as a um, alternative to uh, intermittent large volume paracentesis for patients with refractory ascites with a, with a pretty um, minimal risk of infection. So we did include that in the guidance. And you can probably imagine for patients who are not TIPS candidates, transplant candidates, and coming to the hospital every week for a paracentesis that live like 200 miles away, this could be a potential, um, a potential option. Um, for hepatic encephalopathy, we also wanted to stress this focus on advanced care planning before they lose uh, decision-making capacity. So I just wanted to give a few, in, in the guidance, we actually talk about really important next steps that we believe should be um, incorporated for the field. You know, I think a big part, which we're trying to do um, as advocates in this space is improve uh, the teaching of primary palliative care principles and NGI and hepatology training. Um, I actually this year piloted a serious illness communication trainings course for our GI fellows. I was met with a lot of, um, a, a lot of acclaim um, that we're going to try to repeat every year, um, improving not just um, not just education of GI about palliative care, but really educating palliative care people about hepatology too. So I'm actually part of a lot of different especially organizations in hospice and palliative care where we're working on trying to improve the knowledge and interest of treating our patients with cirrhosis and liver cancer among palliative care clinicians. Um, and then also training the people maybe on our transplant team or maybe on our interdisciplinary teams on palliative care too. Um, I think a big thing that I'm, I've spent what was six, seven years trying to do is try to reduce misperceptions about what palliative care is, not, among, not just among doctors, but among subspecialty societies, um, among patients and caregivers. And I think that's something that we can all do. Um, one thing I always say, because um, I get one question I get a lot is, should we just call it supportive care instead of palliative care? And I think um, one thing I do is just, you know, what you can, one way you can frame palliative care to patients is just saying it's an extra layer of support they can provide patients and their families for physical, mental, psychological, and spiritual support. Uh, and most patients think that that's perfectly fine with them. Um, so I think that there's ways that we can change how we present these things, because obviously if you're presenting palliative care to someone who's not a transplant candidate, who's going to die in two weeks, they're probably going to think that this is just hospice care, that you're just trying to kill them. But if you present it earlier um, and have buy-in from people, I think it could be incredibly powerful. Um, clinical innovation is really important in this space. Um, you know, Understanding what the best fit and the best model would be, whether that's especially palliative care person in our clinics, or whether that's you know understanding triggers for palliative care consultation. And then um, another thing I've been doing quite a bit is, is working with subspecialty societies to define quality metrics for cirrhosis, um, and also try to, try to really um, make sure that there's good reimbursement structures around aspects of palliative care hepatology, such as advanced care planning. Um, also making sure that hospice agencies are really understanding what the needs are for these patients. So lots of work to be done. Um, so I wanted to summarize and just say that, you know, as we know, decompensated cirrhosis is a serious illness. Um, we should be not just aiming to improve mortality in this population, but looking at other outcomes like patient quality of life and caregiver support and quality of life. Um, I want to I want to make sure that you leave this talk not believing palliative care is hospice first and foremost, foremost, but an approach for caring for our patients and their families that can be delivered at any stage of their illness and can be delivered by not only ourselves but also specialists. Um, and I just want you to be appreciate hopefully all of us appreciate um, that there are lots of gaps in our palliative care needs for our patients um, and their families, and that I do think that you know by improving how we, we communicate to our patients, improving how we cross-educate other teams, how we let them in um, is, and this might be pie in the sky, but I think these are the important things that we need to be talking about to improve the overall quality of care for our patients. And so what I'll leave you with is actually one of my favorite quotes, and it came from a JAMA article uh, two years ago. And I think what it gets at is this idea of us thinking about wins for patients that are not just getting them to transplant, but also just supporting um, other things that could be important to them. And it's, so it's about 
holding hope for patients with serious illness. So again, serious illness defined by what I had mentioned. So the quote is, rather than being concerned that hope is either so fragile that it can be lost or so powerful that it can overwhelm decision-making, clinicians should remember that hope is protective, if not necessary, for managing serious illness. Hope is fluid, expandable, and persistent. Holding complex, flexible, and diverse hopes enables patients to believe in the unlikely while simultaneously accepting the inevitable. The role of clinicians is to support both. So I hope you, you have, have appreciated from this that, um, you know, I think our opportunity and, and duty as clinicians is not only supporting those patients that get to that goal of transplant or that goal of extending their life, but but also um, having them have hope for a separate reality, which might be a limited life, but might be helping them get to their daughter's wedding, helping them maintain the strength to play with their grandchildren. I, so I think having hope can mean a lot of things and we should define it in ways that are important for our patients. Thank you so much. That's the end of my talk. Thanks Dr. Patel, that was awesome. Um... And yeah, I did have a chance to read the, the ASLD guidance that you were a co-author of. And it was very well written and um, and the symptom management portion especially is very clear and concise. So the medications I think you touched upon. So um, uh, any questions from the audience? No, I have a few questions. Sure. So the first basic one, I, I guess we always get questioned on is, you know, I think you kind of briefly touched upon your talk, but I just kind of want to reiterate it. The appropriate time to get uh, palliative care in the inpatients, I think we're sometimes always a little reluctant to get them involved. Uh, you know, the patients, you know, overall doing fine, came with like a decompensation, but, um, you know, I feel like a, whenever I'm on the consult service and we recommend palliative care, the team's always a little reluctant to get them involved because um, it's not kind of late stage. But um, I think in your the, the guidance, they mentioned that the, uh, the benefits um, in the inpatient consultation was actually is, uh, uh, is very, is a lot of benefits seen um, rather than holding off on a consultation. So um, when do you typically uh, get the palliative care involved uh, so uh, in the inpatient side? Yeah, no, and I think I think the part of that's a great question. I think part of what makes it also challenging is that depending, so part of it is cultural, right? You know, we we want to believe that we're getting people involved at the right time, and and because a lot of clinicians, including attending physicians, think palliative care is hospice, are going to believe it's at the end at the end of life when there's nothing left. But I, you know, from a practical standpoint, I think we also have to understand that specialty palliative care is a limited resource at depending on what hospital you're in, there might not be a lot of clinicians. So I think the, what I've done is, you know, from a practical standpoint is that, you know, when you're seeing these patients, you have your assessment and plan, like esophageal varices, hepatic encephalopathy, HCC screening, ascites care. You know, I think what we should start doing, which is I've started doing is, is making sure there's a checklist on aspects of palliative care that we may or may not have addressed. And some of them could be, um, you know, advanced care planning, making sure the patients understand what's going on with their illness, addressing caregiver issues, physical and emotional you know, symptom assessments. And we, while we don't have those screening questions and tools yet, I think if we, just like we don't have necessary screening questions and tools about you know, things like ascites and, and paddock encephalopathy, I think it's important to, to think of those as things that should be our priorities when managing patients in our assessment and plan. And if we don't have time or the bandwidth or the skill, frankly, to do that while we're in the hospital, we should consult palliative care, especially palliative care team, and be very specific about what we're asking. So, you know, if um, if a patient is coming in, so what I do in practice is that, you know, if a patient's coming into the hospital and you know we're, they have a meld of 30 and we're talking about transplant and they're like scared that they're going to die which a lot of patients are and you know i i i address that the best i can but this person really needs 45 minutes to an hour with someone to talk to about their concerns and talk about you know things like their goals and values i think it's totally appropriate to get a team involved and call them this patient out of respect for their humanity has the chance to talk with other clinicians about this and do real planning things. And that's kind of what I was getting at with like the first, um, the, the, the case presentation is that we, we don't 
think of these questions that patients ask as data, and they really are, when someone's concerned about their prognosis, when they're concerned about their symptoms and quality of life, that should provoke us to, to address it, not just to ignore it. Um, and if patients mention those things, those are data points that we should use as a trigger for either doing something about it right there and then, or getting getting other people to do it. And you know, so I think I think the other part of it is right. You know, depending on where you practice, there might not be a con a culture of palliative care seeing these patients early. They might be like, "What the hell, this patient you're, you're like yeah. referring to us early, right?" But I think if you're specific about what you're asking them about, it could be really helpful. And and I've never seen a I've never seen palliative care turn down a consult for advanced care planning because that's that's what sixty to seventy percent of what they do. Um, and I will tell you one other thing, which is that you can you you probably would be surprised at how much sicker our patients are than the average patient that the palliative care service is seeing. You know, we're talking about you know patients who are you know, our patients who are with a high meld, sick in the hospital, not a transplant candidate, versus like yeah, you know, I hate to say this, but maybe with someone who has advanced cancer but coming in for their chemotherapy in a scheduled visit and getting a palliative care consult. You know, so if you really think of like the difference in acuity, like our patients are dealing with so much more, um, but we don't we don't always think of it like that because we're sort of we as gastroenterologists are very action oriented. So we're talking about the bleed, we're talking about you know managing that the encephalopathy, we're talking about managing the ascites, or or maybe not. We're giving it two or three days before we talk about those things. We're just really talking about the scope. But this this is the care that the what's happening to our patients is far more burdensome that's what's happening to most patients in the hospital and we should really start treating it like it's like that yeah thank you very much hey Arifa. um amazing talk as always and thanks for the, the the guidance i mean i think i i definitely have referred to your sort of symptom management during clinics i guess one question is sometimes you know, I think palliative care you mentioned is a resource, such a resource. Um, you know, not every not every center have a lot of palliative care. Um, and if you can consult them, it, I feel like it's a huge burden on them too. But sometimes when you take on the onus of, of managing them, you can control a lot of stuff, especially for transplant selection. Um, but for those who are not like sort of in, maybe familiar with the transplant selection process, but if you are co-managing a patient, are there any sort of practices of palliative care or recommendation from the palliative care team that you can share on that would be contraindicated for liver transplantation or selection into basic candidacy. I think one thing that I was thinking about as part of, you know, that, that surrounds a lot of the discussion is opioids. Um, can you share that on, on some of that for the group? Oh, meaning, so I'm trying to understand the question. So you're saying, are there certain aspects of palliative care management that should be contraindicated for a transplant evaluation? Or, or that you find that <laughs> difficult uh, when you're doing selection committee or just discussing the candidacy? Like say if the patient has a lot of pain and they're placed in opioids, is there a safe threshold or I guess how is that looked upon in, in your center? Yeah, I mean, so I'll tell you uh, just as a caveat that I mostly see veterans. So I've not seen patients at the transplant center. So I can't necessarily, you know, comment on the transplant centers, you know, um, you know, practice. I can imagine there would be a significant amount of barrier to that, um, you know, opioid management. I think there would be, a, I think culturally, even at UCLA, there's a significant barrier for palliative care doctors to talk to patients about their goals and values. And and the, the real concern is talking patients out of transplant, right? That's that's the real concern that they have, right? But I think that um, what we've actually skirted that in a few ways. So I think that those, those sorts of roles have to be negotiated really well. Like, you know, if if a palliative care team is starting to start having questions about whether the patient wants to be a candidate or not, they should recognize that that is that is something they should talk with the transplant team about and not necessarily carry forward that for that conversation, bring more people in. So I think that that has to be understood. I, I also think that like if, you know, something like opioid management, right? Like we, we consult the palliative care team, they recommend opioids that are safe for a patient with transplant. They should be rec making those recommendations with the understanding of what is safe for a liver patient and also um, you know, what, is, what is possible with their biology in terms of their encephalopathy. I, I think the truth is that most palliative care clinicians are not trained in this stuff. So there actually has to be 
there has to be an effort by the transplant center to embed palliative care more in the care of these patients and train people up. And I don't think this is any different than how we've trained over the past decade, IR people to see our patients, how we've trained oncologists to see our HCC patients. Like we've, they had to start somewhere. It wasn't that like an oncologist knew how to treat liver cancer patients or an IR person did. I think, I think that there needs to be a new brand of palliative care clinicians who are comfortable in seeing these patients, particularly at a transplant center where there's so much complex decision-making. If you're talking about outside of transplant centers, I really think the bar is quite lower, you know, because we are talking about patients who are quite frankly dealing with um, more of a black and white, potentially more end of life issues, more symptom management. I actually think that there's if, in, if, if for many reasons, actually more opportunity for cross collaboration in non transplant settings, because I do think that people are kind of on the same page about these issues. I think it, at transplant centers, the difference is that there probably needs to be an embedded person who gets trained in this stuff. So a good example is at Ohio State, there's a palliative care doctor that I, I talk with, re, chat with regularly, who's been seeing these patients for five years. And she like gets it. You know, she she gets what a what a sensitive conversation is with the team, when when to kind of slow her role, when she could be she but at the same time, she she also can push a little further um, with some of these conversations more so than any any hepatologist really has. So I think that it comes with it comes with an investment in training, I think more than anything, if that answers your question. Yeah, no, I, I mean I completely agree. I feel like you know, coming from a transplant center, it's just that it's like even that's why I love your quote at the end very like so much is like that the balance and hope for transplantation as well as the hope for or just the aspect of understanding accepting reality. And I you, feel like I think it's really hard to it's a very fine balance between the two. You know, one thing we've done at UCLA, which I've been a proud of, is that we do introduce the palliative care team early. So when um, patients are coming, specifically when patients are coming from an outside hospital. Uh, when they are not like familiar to our team, they're, everyone is a stranger to them. We do actually, we've made more of an effort to introduce the palliative care team early and say like, hey, these are people that, you know, will be involved in your care. They might not be seeing you every day, but it actually just makes it that much easier when, um, when they get the deliberation about transplant. So whether or not they get, um, they get listed or if they're denied listing, they're seen by the palliative care team again. Um, so it's it's kind of that familiar team it, that you know that provides them some comfort that they're kind of getting some continuity care amidst these things because other centers um, I think UCLA does this too they they tr they transfer to another service once they get denied transplant they're sometimes not followed by a primary hepatology or transplant team so that can really be construed as abandonment by a lot of patients. And so having sort of a continuity team follow them that in, in those cases where that's kind of what the care model is, ad, is adapted, that could be really powerful. So that's just even a small thing that could be done, I think, from a care model standpoint. Uh, and that's awesome. Any other questions or any comments? If there are any questions about, um, I'd love to kind of get anyone's thoughts about the serious illness communication uh, documents in the PowerPoint. I'm happy to share them or offer my thoughts on them. Um, if you want to email me or tweet at me, um, I I've uh, I I thought that actually um, taking the Vital Talk course, which is a it's a two day communication skills course, was probably the most important thing I ever did as a hepatology fellow for me. I think it's changed kind of how I communicate with patients, but I always I did my training at Mount Sinai and and there's a huge palliative care you know group there that trains people but um, if you can't do those things I'm hoping that um, those those PDFs or those um, those articles would be helpful to you. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Patel. That was an awesome talk and thank you for those resources. Um, yeah, if anyone does have any questions or comments, uh, we'll end the talk now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.